Hi, I'm your host, Jürgen Strauss from InnovaBiz, and I'm really excited today to welcome to the InnovaBuzz podcast from the UK, Joe Barnes, who's a former tennis coach turned self-help author and hypnotherapist. Joe is known for his unique approach to personal development and for advocating for a rebel mindset and challenging societal norms to help individuals find their true path, one that they choose themselves. Welcome to the Innova Buzz podcast, Joe. It's a real privilege to have you as my guest. Hi, Jürgen. Thanks for having me on. Now, Joe, you've constructed an impressive body of work and your latest book, The Rebel Code, which those of us watching on video can see there behind you, um, and you're wearing the t-shirt to match as well. Um, it's uh, one of many titles you've published, and in that you provide a roadmap for those looking to break free from conventional paths that perhaps society or family or other groups we belong to expect of us, but may not necessarily match with that, what we actually want to do. Um, as we explore your insights on all those topics and experiences further, I'm really eager to start off with what impact you aim to make in the world. I, my main impact obviously is with, with my writing. I really hope that I can reach the minds out there that are looking for an alternative to the conventional way of living and working and inspire them, or at least show them that, look, you, there are other options. You don't just have to conform to what everybody else is telling you is life and the way that life works. So that was, that's always been my inspiration for writing. I really want to, I think writing is such a powerful tool and books are such a powerful tool that you can connect with somebody on the other side of the world and something you've written might spark something in their mind and imagination and give them the idea that it's actually possible to live a life that's more in line with who they authentically feel they are. So my main goal, if I was to put a number on it, is I do want to get to a, a million book sales at one point in the knowledge that probably if you sell a million copies, only 500,000 people are actually going to pick your book up and read it. Most is going to stay on the shelf. Out of that 500,000 people, you may genuinely touch about 10,000. If I could do something like that, I'd be incredibly uh, happy and feel that my life's mission was complete. Yeah, that's wonderful. And, and books are fantastic. And I mean, one of the things I love about books, because I'm giving a presentation to later on today about mentoring in, in the group that, um, the speaking group that I'm involved in. And books I find are, really one form of mentor. I mean, we can be mentored by people we've never even met, people who are around the other side of the world, like you mentioned, from us, people that are no longer with us um, because those books live on beyond them and, and there's so much wisdom that we can get from books. I, I love it. Um, I'm fascinated by your journey and, and you know, I mentioned you're a tennis coach, you um not sure if you're still doing that and, and you're a hypnotherapist as well. So that, was that your path to then becoming an author or was the tennis coach like a side hobby that you had because you, you were good at tennis or? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. It was more my platform rather than my path. Okay. The tennis coach and the hypnotherapy were my platform, which I could then shoot towards becoming a full-time best-selling author. So I left the university having studied politics, um, convinced I didn't want to go into a mainstream conventional career. I knew that much, but I didn't know what the route to you know, living my dream life looked like. So I figured that writing a book as a 22, 23 year old with very little experience and no contacts probably wasn't going to be the path for me. So I thought, well, I better, you know, get myself some money, not only do that, do it in a way which I find inspiring, do it in a way which could maybe add to my life experiences and maybe even do it in a way that could add to the richness of, of my writing ultimately. So tennis coaching was something, tennis playing was something I always enjoyed doing. I played loads of sports as a kid and, and loved them. That was my passion really as a, as a child. And 
had I been more focused, had I had different parents who pushed me more in sporting rather than an academic direction, you know, that is maybe what I'd have liked to have done, been a pro tennis player or, or tried to do something else. I didn't really focus on them that much as a child or, or as with the intensity that you need to have mm. as a child to even give yourself a chance of becoming a pro. So that was out of the question, but I still enjoyed tennis. I still played it to a good level. And I thought, yeah, that would be really good job to have to, to do it with coaching. And while I was doing that, I also training to become a hypnotherapist. I'd become fascinated by the power of the mind while at university. I'd seen a hypnotherapist for a case of insomnia, a bad case of insomnia I'd had. It helped me. And I thought, well, I want to explore this a bit more. I'd also started getting interested in personal development while at university and that and hypnotherapy, they tied in quite, quite nicely. So I did them together. They were my platform. I chose them because number one, I enjoyed the work. Number two, I could be then in control of my time and they pay relatively well per hour. So I wasn't going to need to work 40 hours a week. Yeah. I could do less than that and focus on my writing. And then my writing was something I started to do at a later point once I'd established myself with those two businesses. And then now it's my, it's my main focus. Although, as you point out, I still do, I still do both the tennis coaching and the hypnotherapy. Okay. Yeah. So it's more passion. It's more a, a hobby of love rather than a part of your, yeah, um, I mean, part of your business. Yeah, I, I do. I still need them because uh, writing and selling books is, unless you're doing it on a James Clear level or a, um, who's the other guy, Mark Manson level, unless you're doing it on that level, you're not really making a huge amount of money out of it. I mean, I do make, I draw an income from it, but I need, I still need the, the, um, the hypnotherapy business, the coaching business to, to keep, to keep running them all together for the time being, the, uh, the vision is to become a, or maybe not quite a James clear, but to, to, if I were to hit a million sales, I'd be more than happy. Yeah. Well, I mean, high is really good. <laughs> all right. Well, talk to us a little bit about the rebel code and the principles that you espouse in that, particularly the, um, steps you've outlined there. I know there's a 12 step process you have, but the steps that you outline to help people really understand, well, what is it that I want to do and how do I find my place in the world? Yeah, it's, it's about under, understanding yourself because I point out in the book early on, it's my belief there are three types of people in the, in the world. You're either a leader, you're a follower, or you're a rebel. Or you, you might have tendencies, you know, you might the lines are a little bit blurred. It's not as simple as you're a hundred percent rebel, but you'll be one of those personality types will be more dominant in you. And if you're a rebel, you're in the minority. There are far more followers on the planet than there are even leaders, but there are more leaders than there are rebels. You're living in a leaders and a followers world. So you may not be so sure of yourself. You may be uncertain. You may feel that you don't really have any direction in your life beyond obviously following what other people do as in the leaders and followers. So I came up the, with the 12 steps to give the rebel a sense of direction, a sense of purpose. And so they can find their place in the world and be successful because lots of rebels feel that there's no place for me in the world. The, the world has rejected me. Um, there's nothing I can do. There's nothing really productive I can do. Um, I might turn into a negative rebel in terms of breaking the laws, um, and just becoming generally dif difficult. Um, so I came up with these rules to help those rebels find a direction for their, their lives or rather not rules, their steps. Cause obviously rebels don't follow the rules, but they can <laughs> follow the steps. Um, uh, so basically these steps are. They, one, they deal with finances. Two, they deal with relationships. Three, they deal with your work and finding work you're passionate about. And four, they deal with uh, a philosophy, a life philosophy that rebels can live by. Finally, there are two sort of warning steps about traps that rebels can fall into when it comes to living their life. So 
there's also a, a word of warning, things that every rebel personality type should look out for. It's fascinating. And you mentioned this at the beginning of your explanation that um, it's, there is a bit of a continuing continuum, if you like, that at times we take on the role of a leader, at times we take on the role of a follower, and, and at times we, we do take on the role of a rebel. So whilst we might have a preference for one or other of those traits, we're kind of going between them. And, and I think there's a bit of rebel in all of us, so that, you know, your advice is quite relevant, I think, to everybody. Um, tell us a little bit about what... Um, first of all, the idea of being a rebel and, and owning it and embracing that, whether it's, whether it's, okay, we are that, or whether it's, I'm going to be that for this yeah. particular scenario or this particular event and embracing that and using it for good. Sure. I, I think that comes from a deeper understanding of how the three personality types um, interact with each other and what their purposes are, because you make a good point. We're not just, we're not just one, um, type all of the time. The lines are slightly blur blurred and uh, we may have a, pr a more dominant tendency, but as you say, at different times, you can be different things. So basically at the start of the book, I explained that in very simplistic terms, leaders exist to rule over and enforce the status quo. Followers exist to carry out the status quo. Rebels exist to challenge the status quo and to innovate and create something new. Now, it's not a case that the status quo is always bad. You know, we need um, a certain amount of order in our lives as humanity, as societies, for things to even function. So it wouldn't be, it would be no good if everybody was a rebel and everybody was trying to disrupt everything all of the time. You need to have some degree of stability. But on the other end of the spectrum, if you never have anybody standing up and saying, look, I think we could do things differently or questioning why things are done the way they are. And I feel this point in time, 2024, back to 2020, we're, it's becoming less and less acceptable to have a different opinion, to be a rebel, to speak up and say, no, I don't agree with you, actually. We, we should be trying something else. So I feel the book, uh, the reason I wrote it now is because I think now more than ever, we need our rebels or we need people to embrace that slightly rebellious side in them to create innovation and change. Otherwise you get stagnation and what leads on from stagnation is suffering. So that's how the three um, personality types work together. You've got enforcing the status quo, you've got obeying it, and you've got challenging it. And as long as you have a healthy balance, humanity is going to keep progressing. So I'm basically saying, look, don't forget the rebel. We, we need them right now. Yeah. One of the things you said there, I think is a fascinating conversation. And maybe this touches a little bit on politics. I don't really want to get into politics, but there does seem to be a tendency, or at least I sense a tendency over the last, maybe it's the four years you mentioned, um, but certainly it's it's coming up more and more in the political scene, is that um, there's such a strong level of polarization. And for someone to take on the role of a rebel from the point of view of, why are we doing it that way? Um, why don't we do it a different way? Um, let's explore some other ways to do it is kind of almost, you know, extreme positions and, and the, the leaders who are saying, well, no, this is, this is the process. This is how we do things, um, is the other end of that extreme. And there's no kind of, um, connection between or mm. no sensible conversation that happens around um oh okay well let's explore why we do it that way and let's explore why there might be ways other ways to do it and then let's figure out 
whether we continue to do it this way because we've had the conversation and we decide that's the best process or let's take on board some ideas from the rebel who challenged the way we do it. Why, what can we do as a society and what can, what steps can rebels take, I guess, to bring those sort of conversations back so that it's not a polarizing thing, you know, you're right, I'm wrong um, type mm. of thing. I think we've lost an ability to disagree with each other and be okay with that or, and that we can have differences of opinion and different ideas without wanting to cancel another person because they say something different to you and don't agree. But the rebel's role is always to to question things, to stand up, to be brave enough to do that. And it's difficult because when you feel like you're in a minority and everybody seems to be going one direction, but you have a vision or an idea for another direction that could be beneficial, it can be very daunting to stand up and speak. But the rebel, that's their challenge. They've always, they've got to, they've got to rise to that challenge because the rebels throughout history did question the way things were done, even in the face of ferocious opposition and sometimes successfully changed things for the better. Um, you know, at one point it was rebellious to suggest that women should get the vote. Now, at one point, it was rebellious to suggest that people shouldn't be slaves. So if it wasn't for the rebels standing up and saying, no, this isn't right, just because it's the status quo, just because it's the way things have been done for 100, 200, 1,000 years, doesn't mean that we shouldn't actually question it and think about it. Um, if the rebel doesn't do that, then we don't change. And I think people should recognize that it's okay for their you know, strongly held political ideals to be challenged. That's, that's, that's a good thing. Either they're challenged and we find something better or they're challenged and we find out actually they are correct. And for these reasons, you know, they're stronger for facing the challenge. So I don't think anybody should be getting upset because somebody expresses a different opinion. Um, and we should be learned, learn to be more um, tolerant of, of our different ideas and not to be offended by them so much. Hmm. Yeah, I guess it's, um, I mean, there's lots, you mentioned a few examples, but there's some quite drastic examples in history of, um, people losing their life, people mm. put to death for speaking out a rebel. Like, I mean, that we'd still be thinking the earth was flat or that um, the sun revolved around the earth had we not had rebels that challenged those conventional ideas of the time. And they did so at great personal cost. Mm. Yeah, exactly. I, I make the point. My number two, step number two of the book is... Be guided by your heart when making major life decisions. And the point here is that you've got to listen to your conscience and your inner voice. But I also make the point that just because it feels like the right decision doesn't mean it's going to be an easy decision. And I use the example of Nelson Mandela as somebody who was always guided by his heart when making important decisions throughout his life. But that actually courted danger. He, he was obviously imprisoned. It was a life sentence he received at the time. He very narrowly escaped execution. Um, but he was following his heart all along because he was doing something he believed in. It was the right thing to do, but it wasn't necessarily the easy thing to do. So the book does caution people that, you know, just because you're inspired by something and it may not be challenging anything in the political world at all. It may just be inspired about a product you want to create. Just because you have that inspiration doesn't mean the path that follows mm -hmm. you following that inspiration is going to be easy. Often it's a harder path than leaders and followers have to take, but I argue that ultimately it will be a more rewarding path. Mm. All right. Well, one of the things that I'm curious about and i wonder what your take is 
a rebel by nature, I guess, is almost an individual and looking to realize their own ideas or their own passion, whatever it might be. Uh, how do rebels tap into the collective wisdom, the collective, um, basically enlist support for what, for their ideas, for what they're proposing? I think it, it, at an organizational level, you wouldn't want an organization just consisting of rebels. You would need your followers and you would need your leaders as well. So you would want to build a, a team of people who are going to help you with your vision. If you're, if you know, if, if it's something you need other people to do, you know, for example, with me, with writing, it's very much a solo endeavor. Yeah. I don't need, although I have had a mentor, I had, I do hire people to create covers, to, um, format my book, but it's very much, it's solo driven. But if you're doing something as a team, then I think the point is to recognize that look for all types of people. Don't just it may be good to have a few other, couple of other fellow, fellow rebels to bounce ideas off who, who think differently, but you're going to want in your organization followers and leaders, because otherwise it would be quite an unstable, uh, mm. chaotic organization if it was primarily rebels. So to look, look, look to partner with all types of different people, I would say to, to make sure your, your vision is realized. Mm. Yeah, no, I think, and it comes back to what we we're talking about before that, um, there is a continuum. We're not always the same thing, but yeah, picking, building alliances with people that have different styles can really be beneficial. And likewise, and I think this is where a lot of organizations break down and where innovation gets stifled is they're too focused on the leader follower, um, structure and rebels are either not brought on board or they're silenced or ignored. I think ignored is probably the, the thing I've seen most in, in big corporations. Yeah, exactly. That's, that's the, the whole point. That's again, why the book is, is there because I feel that that does happen. It's too easy because of their numbers. Leaders and followers are always going to vastly outnumber the, the rebels. It's easy for them to be silenced, ignored, and cast to the side at the detriment of everyone, not just the rebel, at the detriment yeah. of everyone, because then we don't get to benefit from new ideas and, and innovation. That's right. All right. Well, let's, I mean, you describe um, your journey I can't remember whether this was the Rebel Code or one of the other books that I um, that you wrote. You describe your journey of discovering your passion and then choosing the paths. What what are the you talk about three paths that people can take to live or to make a living from their passion? What what describe those paths to us, and how can we? kind of think about those in terms of, is this something for me? Sure. That's, so that's delving into my second book, which was called do the work you love. And the whole idea is once you find something you're passionate about, you have three options for turning that into a reality. Now I gave all of these different paths names. The first one I call the adventurous path. So this is about being adventurous. The idea is you've had your moment of inspiration. You now have a plan for something you want to do, you want to create or a business you want to start. So the adventurer just dives straight into it. They may quit their job as quickly as possible, take whatever, whatever limited funds they have and just pour it straight into uh, this new project. And they have the, the benefit of doing that is they have full, you know, full time hours to work mm. on it. The detriment, the, the downside is that it's quite risky. Well, it's very risky. You know, you haven't necessarily got a large amount of income coming in. Maybe if you're, you're living off those savings, but maybe those savings are there to support your family as well. Um, 
you face the risk that you know you may not be bringing money into your new business or your new project for a year, two years. How do you support yourself? But you have the advantage that you've got full focus, full commitment. So that's the adventurous part. And I actually used a little um, fun example in the book about that. I gave an example of the actor um, Brad Pitt. He was actually at university studying journalism, I think. And he, two months before he finished his degree, which seems crazy because you think at least finish the degree, get yeah, the yeah. degree and you've got that as a backup. But no, he said no. He quit uni, drove across the country to Hollywood and just went for it to become an actor. And it took him a while. I think it was about seven, eight years to be really became established. But that's an example of an adventurer, somebody who just ditches everything and goes for it. Hmm. The second uh, path is what I call the strategist path. Now, this is what I used. It's, I didn't try to become an author immediately um, with no resources and no experience. I figured I'd have to build it up slowly. So it's about building a platform which is going to enable you to shoot at your main passion. My platform, as I mentioned, was tennis coaching and hypnotherapy. Yours listening to this or watching it may be a couple of side hustles that you combine. It may be freelancing work. It may be that you're at quite a senior position in your role and you can leave the company and just work as a consultant. And as a consultant, you can alert, earn a lot of money per hour or a lot of money per project you do. And that's going to also free up more time for you to work on your passion. So that's the point of the strategist part. You have to be clever about your work in that you're supporting yourself, yet at the same time, you're freeing up a significant amount of time. I recommend 20 hours, if possible, 10 hours at an absolute minimum, this is per week, to work on your project or business to get it off the ground. So the strategist path is combining a few different things. The final path is called the grinders path. This is where you have no option. You feel you can't quit your job. You just have to try to work on your passion in the little free time you have. And in the book, I offer some time management strategies to be able to do that so that you can maximize the little free time you have so that you can at least scrape together 10 hours a week to work on your business and project and try to build the momentum that can make, um, that will ultimately see you being successful. I know, and quite a few people have to take that path because they feel, you know, they've got bills to pay for their family, mm -hmm. et cetera, for themselves. So that's the adventurous path, the strategist path, the grinders path. Choose one of those and you should be able to, with a significant time commitment, we're talking years probably, um, be successful at making a living out of something you love doing, which is a position, I guess, a lot of people want to be in. Yeah. yeah. And uh, it's a great breakdown of, and I guess it speaks to your um, strategic approach to this. I think it's a great breakdown that opens up possibilities for people because most, I guess there's, there's this preconception that the adventurous path is the way you do this. And most people are not in the position of taking the adventurous path because it's kind of walking the tightrope without the safety net, right? Yeah, exactly. It's high risk. It's the most yeah. high risk of all of them. Mm. Excellent. Well, um, looking at um, the rebel mindset, then what? how do you... How do all of us, I guess, embrace some level of that mindset in a way that it helps us to question things and learn and grow? I think you, you, you answered your question in your question <laughs> in the sense, and I'm going to use the word question yet again, you, you've got to yeah. question that that's the rebel mindset. Don't just accept what you're told. Um, investigate it. Sometimes you question something and you find out you were wrong for questioning it. Other times it can lead to amazing new discoveries. And I think you mentioned that example about 20 minutes ago, um, about we'd still be believing that the sun revolved around the, the earth. 
you know, that was an example of a scientist. I think it was Cop Copernicus originally hmm. who questioned that assumption and said, I don't actually think the, the sun does rotate around the earth from my, you know, uh, my ob observations of the universe and astronomy, I think that the earth is actually rotating around the sun. Let's now see if I can find evidence to, to prove that that's the case. So it's, it's that questioning mind that, um, that, um, helps you access the rebel mindset. Also a little bit of defiance is needed, um, to access the rebel mindset to say, you know, actually, no, I'm going to go with what I believe is right. You're telling me I have to live my life this way, or I have to do as I have to do my work a certain way, or I have to behave in a certain way. I don't think that's right. I'm going to stick to my guns. I'm going to go with who I am and, um, and, uh, be defiant. I'll give you a quick example of that. I watched, uh, there's a really good film called Dallas Buyers Club. And, uh, Matthew McConaughey plays this character, Ron Woodruff. Now, one w w Ron Woodruff contracts AIDS in around the mid to late eighties when, you know, that was coming into mainstream public mm -hmm. consciousness. And he doesn't believe he can have AIDS because he's not gay. He's a straight man. And at the time, you know, they thought AIDS perhaps was only passed on, um, through, through gay men. And he was, didn't, he didn't accept that he could have it, but, uh, he slowly realizes that yes, he's got it. And, um, um, that he's going to have to face it. But the doctor says to him, you should be dead or you're going to die in 30 days. And he says to him, there ain't nothing on earth that can kill one Ron Woodruff in 30 days. It's that kind of defiance to say, no, I'm fighting back against whatever you say. And he actually didn't die in 38 days. He went on to live another seven years, partly because he was a defiant person. So defiance and questioning, um, uh, assumptions, I think help you access the, the rebel mindset. Hmm. Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Um, that story, I, I'm not familiar with that film and I'm going to have to put it on my to watch list now. The the idea, I mean, I've always considered myself as somebody that perhaps has a little bit of rebel in me, uh, but where the rebel will come out, if somebody says to me, this is what you must do, mm. that, that immediately puts me into the mode of why, yeah. why, why can't I do it my way? Why can't, why, why won't this? So I could imagine. Um, in that situation, you're going, you know, the doctor saying, this is, this is what's going to happen to you. I said, well, no, <laughs> I have some yeah. control over this and I, <laughs> I'm going to exercise that control. Yeah, exactly. And it's, uh, yeah, I, you will enjoy the, the movie Jürgen when you watch it. It's a good, uh, a really good one. So, uh, thoroughly recommended. Yeah. Excellent. All right. Well, it's a fascinating journey. I think we'll um, we'll leave a little bit for the listener to um, go read the book and find out more. But I think it's a good point now to move on to the buzz, which is our innovation round. It's the same five questions that I ask of every guest, and the idea is you'll give us some really snappy and insightful answers that'll inspire the listener to go and do something awesome today as a result. Are you all set? I'm ready. Excellent. What's the number one thing anyone needs to do to be more innovative? Oh, at the, uh, <laughs> the risk of repeating myself, um, qu question things, question yeah. assumptions. You know, somebody tells you it has to be that way. Say really is, can we, can we do it some, some way else? I'd also say find inspiration, understand what inspires you because I think inspiration and innovation are very linked. And if you can get yourself in a state, an inspired state, it's very likely you're going to come up with some innovative ideas as well. Mm, yeah. I love the inspiration idea as well. Um, and I think the questioning can come into that as well. If you say, well, why did that inspire me? And what is it about that, that I can take into my 
area that I work in or my area that I'm thinking about right now. Hmm. All right, what's the best thing you've done to develop new ideas? Probably that, what are the second part of my answer to the first question is get myself inspired. I always find that I, I mentioned a movie earlier. Um, I'm really inspired by movies. And if you read my books, you'll see that I use movies as examples throughout my books, just simply because they give me so much inspiration and they, um, sort of take me into another realm of thinking and possibilities. So if I get myself inspired, not just movies, I find music really inspires me. I find books as well, really inspire me. And that then gets me some of my best ideas and, and, and enables me to in innovate. So I would say that that is my answer to that one. Yeah. Wonderful. I love it. Um, and, and there's so much there isn't there that we can choose from in terms of we mentioned books earlier but movies is such a wide variety that's available these days and easy to access as well we don't have to um take time out and go to a movie theater and and stick with the limited choice that might be available through a couple of movie theaters in our area or um in in terms of music the same all right do you have a favorite resource to use most often Favorite resource, um, probably oh, that's a good question. Um, books. Yeah. It's books. Yeah. yeah. You'll see behind me, I've got my little mini library there. Yeah. Um, I do access other resources more and more now, podcasts, um, blog posts, YouTube videos, but I go back to books every time you just the depth in a book you just don't get in any other, in any other form of content. Um, you know, reading a book is there's eight or nine hours worth of knowledge there. You know, you watch a video, it's half an hour. You listen to a podcast, it's an hour. And these are all great and, and convenient ways of acquiring knowledge. But yeah, for me, books is my, my number one resource. And are you more, of uh reader of physical books or do you use the audio book medium? Both for pleasure and taking things in reading for time. If I'm researching on a book, so if I'm researching for a new book, I want to write audio books better because I can then play it in the car. I can get more stuff done and I can, if I come across a useful idea, I can then pause and then go more de in depth into that. So I like, I like audiobooks for their time-saving ability, but if I'm really wanting to learn a concept, then I've got to read the book, you know, sit down and physically look at the words on the page. I find I, I retain information a lot better that way. Mm. Mm. I love it. I, uh, yeah, I, I often take the approach of listen to the audio books. And if I then think, yeah, I need to dig deeper into this, that's, that's when I'll then get the physical book. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Now, what's the best way to keep a client on track when you're working with someone? I think there's, I think, uh, Peter Drucker, there was a his management guru from the 20th mm. century. He said, what gets measured gets managed or words to those effects. Yeah, so yeah. it's getting your client to constantly measure what they're doing in terms of how many hours a week they're working on their project, um, the results they're achieving, making little notes all the time about, um, you know, the, you know, if you're going to do a advertising campaign and making note on how successful it was, how many clicks you got, m m um, measuring everything I think is, is how I keep clients on track because then you're aware of what's going on and you're able to manage, manage what you're doing and discover, you know, what is and isn't working. Cause a lot of the time success isn't just about what is working. It's about eliminating all the time wasting yeah. stuff that, that doesn't actually work for you. So I would, I would say that measuring, getting clients to measure things is, is the best way to keep them on track. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And in your work with hypnotherapy, how does that play out? Because often I imagine there's some 
soft things happening there. Um, although I suppose if, if we take your example of curing insomnia, that, that's uh, fairly easy to measure, I suppose, if you're waking up less or s- sleeping more. So I would say yes with that. It'd be funny how many things you can measure when you actually break it down. Obviously, weight loss, there's a clear thing that you can measure. You can measure that on a scale every week or every day or whatever you want to do. Um, But yeah, you're right. With hypnotherapy, there is a case that it's just a shift that occurs sometimes. And you can't actually quantify it in terms of a number. You just feel different. You feel that something has been lifted off uh, your spirit. You feel lighter. You have more confidence. So often it is with hip- hypnotherapy. Just what we're talking about is a change of state. You you mm-hmm. notice suddenly, oh, I'm 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 actually feeling a little bit better now. I can use a personal example here in that my I you know I'm a Obviously, I mentioned I do tennis coaching, but I also play. I also compete. I compete on the what's called the Masters ITF tour. And I often notice with myself, you know, trying to use my hypnosis, my self hypnosis ability to help my tennis game. And I, you can be cerebral about it on the court. You can think, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. Or you can keep trying to focus and tell yourself to, to be confident. But it's often you just notice a slight shift in your mood. Something clicks, you start to feel a little bit better, and that's when the real change occurs. So I guess what I'm trying to say is look for those, just that little shift in your mood, in your state. And I feel a bit lighter, a bit more confident, and then go with that. Understand that there's power in that, even though you can't quantify it, you can't measure it. It's that feeling that you've had a bit of a shift is is powerful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, that's an interesting point. And if you watch competitive sports at a very high level, competitive, you can actually sense that um, in in a lot of situations, particularly in individual sports. Um, and I've been watching a lot of Olympics. Um, this summer, of course, um, Northern Hemisphere summer, the um, just sometimes there's all of a sudden there's a shift, and even in team sports you can sense that all of a sudden there's a shift in momentum from one team dominating to suddenly the other team's dominating. And you think, how can that be in the same game with the same personnel or something? And it, it's it's exactly that, that, isn't it? There's been some some kind of shift in mindset. Um, people have managed to do yeah state i always use the word state you shift in your state something you just feel differently and then suddenly it clicks it's amazing how that that can work sometimes excellent all right final question of the buzz round what's the number one thing anyone can do to differentiate themselves i would say be, you can so there's only one of you, isn't there? So the more yeah. you, you tap into who you really are, the more you're going to come across as unique and individual. Um, I don't, I sometimes think it's when you're marketing yourself, you want to create a slight sense of fami- familiarity, yet you've got to balance that need to stand out as well. So. Yeah, I would say look for the things that that are authentically you. I I think Robert Greene in his book Forty Eight Laws of Power, one of the laws is a court court attention at all times, and he talks about various different ways to make yourself stand out. Something about the way you dress, something about the way maybe a catchphrase that you use. Um, and something about perhaps the way you look now, you should never do it in a way which is cringy or, um, gimmick too gimmicky, but consider using those things. I mean, that's the way reason I'm wearing this t-shirt today is to, to link in with the book. I'm trying to stick in people's minds I'm trying to create some kind of attention, but I don't want to do it 
in a way which isn't um, authentic because mm. then I think it comes across as just too contrived and see-through and it actually puts people off. So be authentic but and try to court attention, but don't, don't do it in a uh, too contrived a manner. Yeah. In some ways, it comes back to what we were saying earlier about embracing the inner rebel. It's embracing the things that make you who you are, isn't it? Yeah, that's, mm. that's, that's important. There's only, there's only one of you. So yeah. if you stick to that, you are going to stand out. Excellent. All right. Well, thanks for getting us through the buzz round, Joe, and thanks for the conversation so far. It's been really wonderful. Now, where can people find out more about you, about the work you do, about your books, and maybe even reach out and say thanks for what you've shared today? Sure. So number one place is probably my website. That's www.escapethesystemnow.com. Go there and you'll find a contact page if you want to reach out to me, say hello. Uh, you'll also find my blogs. You can read all my blog posts there and a little bit more about what I'm doing. Um, the book is on Amazon. I will share a link with you, Jürgen, so that when this does go out, if anyone is interested in getting the um, Kindle version, so I've got the physical copy here. Unfortunately, I can't offer you a discount on that, but I can offer the Kindle version for just one US dollar um, for the 48 hours after this airs as a, as a special offer for your listeners and viewers. Um, search the Rebel Code Joe Barnes on Amazon, or if we can get a link set up, then you can just click that and go directly. In terms of social media, maybe Instagram, uh, Escape the System 19 is my Instagram handle. Uh, it's probably most active there. Um, but best place is the website or just go direct and check out the book. Excellent. All right. Well, that's great. Thanks for that offer. I will cert we'll certainly have links to all those places in the show notes. So you can click straight through and hopefully if you act quickly, get that special offer of the Kindle book. All right. Well, finally, Joe, what action would you like our listener to take out of our conversation today? Um, well, ideally by the book, but, uh, <laughs> if, if not, I guess just to, just to ask more questions, challenge more assumptions, commonly held assumption, conventional wisdom that people tell you, you should do it this way. Start to question it, start to challenge it and see whether it leads you in any exciting new directions. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah. That's a great call to action. And certainly for a a dollar, I, I suggest you act now and click on that link and take that action. Then you can find out a lot more about uh, what we've been talking about today and the work Joe's doing, and then take the action that he suggested, question things a lot more. Excellent. Well, thanks so much for sharing your time and your insights so generously with us today, Joe. I've really enjoyed our conversation and I um, look forward to your future books. So um, I'll be watching your website and your Instagram and your Amazon account and seeing what comes up next. But please do stay in touch so that we can uh, we can find out as soon as the books are about to launch. Oh, it would be a pleasure, Jürgen, and definitely would like to come back on the show when I've got a new one when it's finally released. But thanks again for for having me on. <laughs>